one of the biggest uh, challenges that we face is in educating people about the importance of quality. Uh, you know, we are a society which has followed the traditional transition in the education space, which is you address first the issues of enrollment and access, and then sequentially you start thinking about quality. So we've actually, to a large extent, been successful in, in addressing those issues of, of access and of enrollment. There are all kinds of reports which show that you have 93, 94% enrollment today. But I think the next big step is really in, um, in making people aware of the importance of children who go to school actually learning something. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, to do that, you're going to have to have a fairly... Um, sustained and widespread sort of campaign which which uh, brings out the fact that education is and quality education is is important for for the future of this country for the future of each individual and so on uh, the the Asar report that that everybody keeps quoting the annual status of education report in Pratham um, they've had some interesting experiences when they've gone to the villages to look at uh, whether the child is learning or not and uh, in many cases they are told by mothers or by fathers that we are not literate ourselves so how can we tell whether the child is learning anything at all, at all or not to which their response very very rightly has been aap maa hai aapke bacche ko jab bukhar hota hai to aapko kaise pata chalta hai and the mother will respond that yes i i can take his temperature i feel that he's not well etc etc to which then they respond that but you're not a doctor so how do you know so i think that is the kind of message that needs to be given and people need to be made to understand that just because they themselves are not necessarily literate. Uh, it doesn't mean that they cannot or that they do not have the right to question whether the child is learning in school or not and, mm -hmm. and to demand accountability from the school. So I think that's one big challenge. The other big challenge would have to be, uh, in my view, teacher accountability. Today the biggest uh, uh, difference that there is between government and private schools is not so much in terms of provisioning or in terms of what happens in the classroom but in terms of the fact that in a private school nine times out of ten the teacher will be available and teaching mm -hmm. uh, which you cannot always say of the government school and I think demanding teacher accountability and ensuring that it happens is probably also equally important. This is, tr this is a very tricky area and, and frankly I uh, uh, I have, I have a sense that this is not something that is being addressed within government. Um, we do understand that private unrecognized schools exist. We know that the numbers have increased exponentially over the last few years. But we do not actually have very much documentation about uh, numbers, types, etc. Stands to reason, you know, by definition they're not recognized so they don't fall in uh, anybody's uh, sort of radar. Um, from the government perspective, I think the way they are looking at it is only that uh, all schools must meet minimum criteria mm -hmm. and uh, if they do not meet that minimum criteria then those schools should be asked to shut down. Mm -hmm. That is really very 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 simply put the, the stand that is being taken. Uh, it's groups like yours which are uh, uh, representing the human interest here or the, or the fact that uh, it's not just about, it's not only about the children, it's also about livelihoods. There are teachers who go to those schools and teach in them. Uh, there are proprietors who have set up those schools. Uh, and for them, these are means of livelihood. So quite apart from the whole aspect of, uh, of the children, because it's quite easy to argue from, and the government can very easily argue that uh, well, we'll improve the government school system so they don't really need to go to an unrecognized school. They can always come to a government school and, and they will get an education. But what happens to all those uh, thousands and thousands of people who are going to be suddenly out of a job? So I think those are issues which um, are not really being focused upon mm -hmm. and perhaps there is a case for CCS and other groups like yours to uh, you know sort of build a little bit of public consciousness about these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. The fact is that as things stand today, <coughs> once the Right to, uh, to Education Act is implemented, these schools will either have to comply within three years or have to shut down. There's just, there are no two, two ways around that. They may be able to uh, delay st shutting down for a bit, they may be able to stave it off. Uh, but that will only lead to increase in rent collection opportunities for uh, the people who are responsible for inspection and monitoring. Mm. Uh, but over a period of time, if things stand exactly the way they are, I don't see any alternative for them but to shut down. Mm. Well, there are two or three things here. 
<coughs> I think when you look at SMCs or states, school management committees, um, first of all, many states already have school management committees. You know, village education committee was something that SSA provide, provided for, but it didn't replace the school management committees where the states had already set, set them up. So that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing is already in place. Second, these SMCs will apply only to government schools. They're not going to apply to the private schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, schools under private management are out of the purview of this particular clause in the in the act. Uh, <clears throat> third, I think when people talk about school managing committees, very often what they tend to forget is that Indian society is not a homogeneous society. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about say community involvement or community participation, uh, somehow the impression is created of some kind of a vanilla. Uh, 1950s USA community, you know, suburban community where everybody is the same and they all live together happily ever after and therefore they work together and you have soccer moms and things like that. But the fact is that in Indian society and particularly in the rural areas, uh, communities are extremely diverse and heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. And even though say uh, the, the act provides that, for instance, 75% um, uh, of the members of that uh, committee must be parents of the school. Okay, it also provides that suitable representation should be given to uh, people from disadvantaged classes, uh, the Dalits, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, my question is that in a village scenario where the the Dalit is typically not used to being able to interact with the higher castes, mm -hmm. what is the guarantee that he will be able to open his mouth in a school managing committee meeting? Particularly in a situation where the teacher, in, in a large majority of cases, will tend to be from one of the forward castes. Mm -hmm. How effective is he likely to be in uh, demanding accountability or his rights in, in the SMC? So if you look at the SMC as being a mechanism by which the school's uh, performance is going to improve, merely because the act says so, I think that's not going to happen unless it is accompanied by a very large scale and, and, and a very uh, vigorous sort of uh, campaign that looks at social change as well. Mm. This is one more factor which will contribute eventually to social change. Just like the introduction of the midday meal in in, uh, in West Bengal, for instance, has been documented to have reduced uh, social distance and reduced caste barriers because children of different castes are sitting together and eating. So it contributed indirectly in some way to to taking this forward. Mm. I think the introduction of the SMC will also perhaps do that over time. But in the immediate short term, to expect that the SMC will suddenly wave a magic wand and change everything, I think that's being unrealistic. Okay. Uh, if you remember Karthik Murlidharan's presentation this morning, uh, very clearly brings out that uh, wherever there's an SMC, it doesn't necessarily translate into a better performing school. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, it is, it's where there is an active SMC. Mm -hmm. And that's the interesting uh, you know, addition. It's where, where there is an active SMC, that there is an improvement in the accountability of the school. So how do you, the question really is, how do you ensure that activeness of the SMC? How do you make sure that it becomes a really activist or active sort of um, SMC which starts asking questions, uncomfortable ones if necessary. Mm. Uh, the other thing is that this act has diluted the provisions of the earlier bill which was circulated in 2005 where the teacher was actually directly accountable to the SMC. Mm. Because the SMC was responsible for sanctioning leave, it was responsible for payment of wages, it was responsible for even imposition of minor penalties. Mm -hmm. And those clauses have all been done away with in the 2009 Act. Mm -hmm. So um, really the, SM, the role of the SMC has been left very vague as uh, in terms of saying it will monitor the functioning of the school without really saying what it will do. I would expect that uh, there will be some description of what it will do in the rules that are currently being framed. But I think we have to wait and watch and see what they come up with. Okay, the first one I know immediately because this is something I've been advocating for some time. I would say open up the sector for private investment. I think that is something that is long overdue and I think we need to, uh, we need to move away from the uh, sort of statist welfare model of education to being open mm -hmm. to uh, private investment with, of course, uh, appropriate regulation, making sure that it's not exploitative and all of that. But I think we need to move away from this model where we insist that every educational institution must be owned by a foundation and then compel people to bend the law 
<coughs> by setting up subsidiary companies which provide services to the foundation and then take the money out from the foundation. I think that's that's really making a mockery of the whole thing. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is that is something that I would I would definitely do. Uh, the other thing that I would like to do if I were the minister would be to focus on early childhood care and development, I think. Because uh, that is a critical area which has been left out of, uh, of the Act. Uh, primarily because the constitutional amendment only talks about 6 to 14, so the Act also has to talk about 6 to 14. Although it does say that um, <clears throat> uh, to the extent possible the state shall endeavor to provide early childhood uh, education to children below 6. The problem with that one is that Article 45 for almost 50 years said that the state shall endeavor to provide free and compulsory education to, the, to every child below the age of 14 and that endeavor didn't get us very far. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I would look to make early childhood care, uh, early childhood education compulsory and to look at how it's possible to improve the current situation of, of ECE.